with a higher rent than you should. Mm -hmm. Already high rent neighborhood that's not dense enough. And you're in a town where there's, at that point, there was 400,000 people down here. Now there's like almost half a million. Okay. But it's 2.2 metro, or two, I think it's 3.2.5 metro. So surrounding Kansas City, the suburbs are huge. So what you find in the city is the build of clientele is slower and longer than other places because people got to hear about you and then come down here on the weekend. And then, you know, so the first couple of years, it just when you open and you're losing twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month, and you're already way over budget, it's just like the scariest shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, and what are your investors like at that point? I feel like those are the well, they're, I think, they're the calm ones. I feel like because they know they like yeah, oh yeah, yeah restaurants. Yeah, I think it was. I mean, were you on the cusp of like we're closing? So when you do a when you when you do an investment for this type of thing, you basically have to your investors have to be accredited. We're basically you can light their money on fire because. Mm-hmm. That the mistake is if they, their livelihood depends on this investment. <laughs> it's a fucking fine dining restaurant. Bro, don't put your house so up. So we, we had good lawyers. Yeah, okay. Also, our, our opening attorney ripped me off. He, he went like $40,000 over his estimated spend because he just took forever on everything. What the fuck, man? And that's a whole process you learn of. It's pretty standard. You go contest a lawyer and then they meet you in the middle or something. But anyway, he ended up leaving a firm and threatening me with my livelihood if we don't pay this bill. And I consult another attorney, and they're like, no, 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 don't pay anything. He's just, basically, he's just trying to get a payout when he leaves his firm. What the fuck, So he's dude? got his partner attorney telling us that we really need to take care of this because we could get sued. And it's just like, it's just such shady shit. Yeah. What he's, a crooked fuck, dude. That guy Between sucks. Between him and the, the, the architect that just doesn't do the research. And yeah. They just, our, when our bids came back for the HVAC on this it was like a couple hundred thousand more than they estimated I'm just like you f- I mean this is a amazing architect like, yeah it's cool yeah it's modern but it's like they don't do restaurants and that's the biggest any chef don't get a all the style in the world don't get an architect that doesn't do restaurant kitchens and the whole package and knows that finance that's yeah my number one is don't do it okay and don't open this big of a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did the did the construction take longer than expected yeah, too? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like always. Another one you learn is so your <laughs> landlord gives you a three month turnaround. You have to pay. It's like, and then now I know that if you know what you're doing, you tell them six months. Yeah. Three for months sure. is stupid. Hundred percent. But they got us. Yeah. They they just got us and laughed about it. You know. And, right, not really, but like it's just like we're first time entrepreneurs. Like all our shits on the line. Like we worked so hard to get here. Why would you? Why would you? I just don't understand it. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, they don't like success, it seems like. But we hustled and we stretched that cash flow for the first year and we built that clientele. I mean, when we had, when we opened it, we had like Tuesdays where you do like 23 people in this bigger restaurant. Yeah. So, what? Do you put them all in is, there? Is there a way well, to, Well, like, you're almost, like, embarrassed because you're, like, yeah, so big. No, I hear you. <laughs> but now, like, so you'll come in for dinner, and tonight is probably, like, the slowest night we'll ever have. Uh-huh. I think we have 65 on, and we'll double. We're going to do 120, 130. A lot of walk-ins this way? Yeah. Okay. Because four and a half years later, there's, like, 12 new apartment condos in this, like, yeah. eight-block radius. Yeah. People are moving down here and living down here. Well, but also people just know... Like two years in, people are like, "You own a restaurant? What's it called? Where are you? Where's that?" And it's like two yeah. years in. Like it's just not that. Like there was a lot of hype about Kansas City and the restaurants and this, but it's really not that big of a restaurant city yet. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's really it's blowing it's, up. It's starting to blow up. Got you. And people want to go somewhere where it costs a little less. And I hear you. Yeah. How is uh, how is the living situation over here? Super affordable. Yeah. And you can also like. You can have a cool condo down here, and you can find one that's affordable in these areas. You can also have a garage in the backyard eight minutes from here. Mm-hmm. A cool neighborhood that's super affordable. Very cool. Fuck. So uh, you mentioned you were going to try to open another spot. Is that a... Well, so when shutdown happened, we'd been open three years, and we were finally like, 
we had our first like five like very profitable months in a row. Yeah. I mean, the first two and a half years was just like a lost month. Figuring a it little, out. A little high month. Oh, we made it to December and we made 30 grand, made up for the 40 grand we lost over the last five months. It's just like, it's rough. But we're finally like positive, positive, positive. You just, all those covers are increasing and we're just really hitting our stride and then the pandemic. And also like, Christina, we're traveling, we're going to food festivals and going and cooking at other chef's restaurants. Mm-hmm. And so you're just trying to get the name out there. We, we got nominated for a Beard Award the second year and or wait, first first year, right before we went to the thing, I met all these chefs, all these chefs, you know, I was like, saw Michael Simmers do one of the fucking, did shake his hand, I cooked with him a couple years before yeah. that, I'm just like, these legends I look up to, right? And now you're fucking peers. Yeah. And then it's like, the shutdown happened, and so I guess I said it, I was like, if this pandemic happened any time before this, we would not have made it. We wouldn't have made it till that first. Yeah. That first financial assistance, we would have been done. And it would have been to no point in fighting at that point when you're not really making money yet. Yeah. So we were just old enough. And that's a lot of the restaurants that just closed up were new and didn't have any runway, right? Or I saw a lot of restaurants are like, if you're 10 years old and you don't really make any money, you're just kind of like keeping some employees on. And they're like, well, what's the point? Yeah. So they packed up shop too. Whoa. But we had been working on, people love this cheeseburger, and I think it I, sounds funny because, like, how many fine dining chefs have done, like, a cheeseburger or, like, a pizza? <laughs> like Dude, a, I mean. And, but it's, like, you want to connect to people in a different yeah. way, and then it blows up. And I, it's it's so good. I mean, I, I'm excited to try it. You I had the. Uh, so you have to try it. Man. I had the Big Kids Burger up there in Chicago. That shit is a bomb. Big Kids, we ate there last time. It was good. So much mayonnaise on that fucker. I'm like, oh, it's just, like, fucking... Just like being a kid. Yes. <laughs> it was awesome. It was awesome. Um, I love that guy. He he was he did a good podcast too. So we're like, you know, I made a list of two thousand names. We were like, what do we call this damn thing? We want to do. I wanted to do a fast casual, and we came up with Ravenous, to the Raven. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. Fun name. I like if Corvino fails, Ravenous still be a good burger spot. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Um, which it's not. We're good now. We're, we're solid. <laughs> we're, we're so healthy. Like, yeah. Two years after the, out of the pandemic and a year of like just super positive growth. Like, it's it's amazing. Um, but we'd started lunch at Ghost Kitchen three months before the pandemic. Yeah. So I had an online ordering set up. I had this burger menu. I had this super cool artist friend out of from here moved to New York, Europe, branding. So we had a logo. We had branded. We had a online ordering so when the pandemic hit we were like Corvino's bows ravenous it's it's cheeseburgers and chicken sandwiches to go and we did it for four months and we started doing family dinners and holiday dinners and yeah I mean all it did was pay our core management team they couldn't pay rent we could pay our cost of goods and our management team we couldn't pay anything else so we're just doing that like, if we don't keep our management team, how do we ever start this big ship again? Exactly. It'd be, you know. Um, yeah, you don't want to repeat the first two years again. No. <laughs> so we kept the management team, and then when it opened, and it was hard, because, like, we opened to five days instead of seven. And, you know, you're, you're limited seating, you're not making any money. And we came out, you know, now we got the landlord back. We pushed him real hard. Got a lot of record age. They're like, well, what are you going to do? It's going to cost you more money to lose us. You know? So we, you know, they got us a little bit because we were new and we signed this lease. But then you got, got them. I mean, we survived. Yeah. Um, and it's a business. They got to pay more. I mean, I get it. But mm-hmm. it's not all. But like, um, and it was weird because there's, you know, you got that first little relief fund. And we opened at half capacity, and we blew through it because you're not making enough money. Mm-hmm. And this happened to so many people. I talked to so many sh- owners. Who they're like, "We're fucked because there's no more money coming." And and we were like, we hit like cash flow the fucking negative. Like ran through all that money like five or six months, whatever months later. And we yeah. Was like, well, and then we'd have a little. We were positive and slowly climbing. And dude, I I played that cash flow game when you open like I can stretch I can make it but then like 
the, um, a new mask mandate restriction comes and nobody's coming anymore and it's like son of a bitch you know so yeah. it's like but then when that second and I've got really involved with the Beard Foundation and Restaurant Coalition and we were trying to just like voice it and get it out there like that we all need help and when that came out like yeah it was I mean it saved our ass but also it came out and we were very fortunate here that it did open up faster even though the, the still 50% people in this area that aren't vaccinated is pretty concerning but like I don't know, I just came back from France and they, they're like, it's the same shit here. People don't want to get vaccinated. So. Yeah. I mean, um, What's the deal in France? People wearing masks? People enforcing it? Or? Yeah, they do vax cards at restaurants, all that stuff. Okay, okay, people, great, but, great. But they did, they did, like, it's still, like, there's a lot of French people in Britain that don't want to get vaccinated. So this isn't a United States specific. This is an everyone problem. Yeah, it's weird. Well, I mean, after all the all the facts came out about the fucking lab in Wuhan and all that shit, I think people are like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so you made a disease, and then you had to make a cure <laughs> real quick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all nerve wracking shit. I mean, uh, I don't, you know, but, I'm no expert, but I say, we well, got vaxxed, you know, if you got vaxxed, I think, I think we're all set. I don't know. I think coronavirus just, is here to stay. Yeah. I think it's just the flu now. Yes. It's just what it is. I mean, we had, it hit us, like, right when we closed down, we had, we did a carry-out dinner for a lady who's 32, had their wedding reception here the year before, and her husband died at, like, 30. What the fuck, So man? it's like, you're hearing all these people, young people can't die. I'm like, no. Yeah. Like, so right away, and we had a couple other close connections where I was like, this shit's real. Yeah, dude. This shit's scary. Yeah, it was real and scary. So we took scary. it super serious in the beginning. We were like... How many tables did you remove? Half like of them? 20%. Yeah. yeah. It's so barren in here. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, yeah, that was... For Charter Oak, too, that was like... That fucking... Yeah. There's like 15 tables in the dining room. We went down to like seven. And it's just weird. It was weird. And then there was like... I don't know. It's just such... Like, every, we all got up so engrossed into the political stuff. Yeah. Social... I mean, a lot social of... Social issues, and I was like... I guess... Like so much of it is wanting to be involved and passionate about, but then you learn all these lessons too. Like it's like, I mean, some of like putting some stuff out there was like, did it do any good other than make people be really shitty to us? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, exactly. It's kind of like prioritizing. Like, yeah, I think most of all, I just got so sucked into the news. I was so infatuated with like Portland and that's back by home, and like, and it's just like it's the same shit. You're not learning anything being sucked into Twitter all day long. Exactly. So, I mean, I'm so shut out of it now. I don't pay attention to anything. I'm just like... Yeah. And it's dangerous, too. I mean, shit, you say anything, people are like, whoa. Whoa, buddy. I mean, I, shit, I might get canceled. Who knows? <laughs> so, we took that ravenous concept from here. When we opened here, we couldn't pull off a ghost kitchen because I don't have a big enough... You have a big kitchen, but I don't have a second line. Yeah. Like, we prep on the dinner pass in line during the day, and then that's where... See, I couldn't do lunch, right? Because I need another line to prep. Yeah. So we were like, what do we do with this thing? It's rolling, and I put it in this food hall down the street. And I did that for five months. And it was a nice little supplemental revenue. It really got kind of exposed. When summer hit, their air condition didn't fucking work. Ooh. And I couldn't fix it, so I broke my lease and got out. But at that point, we're starting to really cruise here, and I was like, I don't need that money. And I also, like everybody, I was so stuck on... I'm going to scale this fast food thing and it's going to make good food accessible and I'm going to put them in maybe neighborhoods where people would never come here and get my touch people with food. And it's like, it's the wrong concept. Like I learned so much and soul searched so much through this pandemic because I was like, I realized it's not what I want to do. Yeah. Um, like I started talking to a consultant about it and talked about how you set up the processes and how to co-pack all this stuff and like, like my real estate guy about like he's gonna connect me with like the <clears throat> Freddy's this huge burger chain that's blowing up around here and like the Hawaiian Bros and like I just realized like you're not it's so far from what I want to do like, yeah they're kind of real estate deals and the restaurants almost make that deal good but it's like it sucks all the bad you know, there's no kitchen culture there's no exactly 
um, 